Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. You are watching the Paris Fintech Forum Communities video interview series. I'm Elliot Gottkin, and today I'm joined by the CEO of Nickel, uh, Marie de Grand Guillot. Great to have you with us. Thanks. Very happy to be with you. Okay, so before we get cracking, uh, let's learn a little bit more about Nickel. So, uh, I think it's been 10 years since your launch. It's your 10th anniversary year. Congratulations. Uh, now, during that time, you've arguably become the biggest neobank in France. Tell us briefly how you did it. Well, it's a long journey, so it's not so easy to answer this question. But it, I can tell you that it was pretty intense uh, from the first days by the founders until now after the acquisition by BNP Paribas and the acceleration of the growth. But we were very proud and very happy. We were we have to pay 4 million clients and we continue actually while accelerating the business, we continue to be very in line with our DNA from the first day, which is combining digital uh, with physical network of sales and uh, financial inclusion. So all that is making the story a bit uh, unique and we are very, very happy to be and proud to be a part of it. And you mentioned, of course, your acquisition by BNP Paribas, I think, in, in 2017. Of course, BNP has its own digital offerings as well as uh, as well as Nickel. How do all of these digital offerings manage to exist harmoniously and profitably inside such a big bank? Yeah, well, BNP Paribas is one of the top five biggest bank in the world and uh, definitely one of the, the biggest in Europe. So it's huge. It's huge to be part of, in, to be part of the group. Indeed, BNP Paribas is active in the retail banking industry with traditional uh, banks in many European countries and with also digital banks. But we are very uh, complementary with what, with the other uh, subsidiaries or with the other off offers inside the group. So there is no competition between us and there is a big room for us to continue growing at a very, very large scale inside BNP Paribas. And then uh, being acquired by, by such a group, it's, of course, a big challenge, but it's also a huge chance. I have to say that we we make the most of uh, all the expertise inside the group, of the knowledge, of the uh, the international uh, understanding in markets. So it, it's a, it was part of the key asset, I think, that enabled the acceleration of the growth of the company. And you talked about, you know, you're, you're not competing with other bits of, of, of BNP's uh, digital offering, I think, uh, inside the bank. But of course, in terms of your offering to the French public, I suppose the unique aspect is not that you had bank branches everywhere, but that you were available through the ubiquitous tabacs or tobacconists in, in France. Um, if I'm un understanding correctly, FDJ, the operator of the French National Lottery, which of course has a long-standing relationship with the Tabax, has now also entered kind of the payment or banking space. Um, what, what does that mean for competition for you? Because you've kind of had this Tabac financial services market to yourself for 10 years, and, and now you've got some competition there. Yeah, I mean, we've definitely, uh, we've definitely, we have definitely, sorry, a unique model combining the best of digital with the network of tobacconist shops in France. So basically, you can open an e-cal account in a tobacco shop in five minutes. So you share your, some information, then you will, at the end, pay 25 euros and go back with uh, your card. The, the, the debit card will be working. And with your IBAN, it's something pretty unique. And it's expanding, of course, a lot of the success of the company because those shops have very long opening opening hours. They welcome everyone the same way. We feel comfortable inside those shops. They're not so much judgmental or or complex to understand for, for our clients. So so it's of course one of the key aspects of the success story of the company. Um, when uh, when I look now at the competition, I mean we're quite happy to see competition entering because uh, I think it's uh, it, it comes with a success. And uh, and when you look at our numbers. We have for more than, um, we'll reach the 4 million target very, very soon. We are active in five countries. We have more than 10,000 uh, point of sales partnering with us in all those countries. We are a profitable business since 2018. And so all that is explaining, I think, uh, the why uh, FDJ uh, is uh, starting to look at the market and trying to build a competitor. Then competition is always for the most for the clients. So at the end of the day, we'll be uh even more challenged even even though if, even though we are every day putting the, the maximum energy to to be the best for our client to be the best player to offer the best experience 
And um, we have, of course, we are, we are maybe 10 years ahead because we have this experience. We have a full offer. Uh, we have uh, already all those clients sharing the how much Nikiel has changed their life to their friends and family, which is explaining the, the speed of the growth. So all that are assets that we have. But of course, uh, this new competitor knows the point of sale. They try to, uh, they will try to be as good as what we are and we'll see how we can uh, uh, continue to be the best on the market. And you said you're already in five European countries. Just uh, briefly, in terms of your plans for future expansion, where to next geographically and also in terms of products, I think you're also getting into the credit and insurance more as well. So what, what should people expect uh, for the future from uh, Nico? Yeah, so we were when we designed our strategy in uh, 2019, uh, we said, okay, we want to become European because our model was very, very strong and very um, relevant in many European markets. Now we are active in Spain, Portugal, Belgium, Germany, and France, and we definitely think that we have a lot to build here. In all those markets, we have a very strong ambition. We don't want to be, you know, one uh, another secondary player. We really want to to touch. Uh, hundreds thousands of people. So at the end of the day, we are at the very beginning of the story because we've launched. We're very proud to launch because it's all the energy of our teams, you know, building the project and and uh, and getting the license and building building the network. But but we have still a lot to do in those markets. So today we will we're focusing on those five markets very much in terms of international growth. And in terms of product, you're right. One of the specificities specificities of the model is that uh, for two thirds of our clients, we are the main account. So they expect from us what they can have in any other traditional players. And so they were asking, they were asking more and more to us, okay, I have projects I want to finance, but I don't have access to credit. Or I have, uh, I, I have, I face some risks and I need a good insurance at the fair price. So in all the situations before we were saying, okay, story for us to try to help you in those, those matters. We want to really continue focusing on the on the current account. Um, but today, because of the, the volumes of clients we have and because of what they expect from us, we're trying to, after uh, having launched the, the account for everyone, we're trying to look at the insurance for everyone, at the credit for everyone, or at the, the savings for everyone. And we are doing so by partnering with other fintechs, uh, to really try to to make the most of uh, the expertise and knowledge of everyone, and uh, and the trust that our clients have uh, with us. Okay, so uh, we've heard a bit about Nickel. Uh, let's now learn more about Marie. So. Um, you came from a kind of consulting and microfinance background. Why the switch into into banking, mainstream banking, if you like? Well, even the switch bit into banking, even uh, before this one, I did one other one, which is, which is even more curious because I went from consulting to NGO, then to NGO to finance, from NGO to finance. And I think that what is moving me is definitely, uh, on one hand, learning and, and being exposed and, and taking a lot of responsibilities. So uh, this is one thing that I've, I've done a lot. And the second thing is uh, being useful, uh, changing a bit uh, the word or, or, uh, or things that, should, that are a bit unfair, that are a bit unfair in our society. So doing it through an NGO was uh, something very, very, uh, um, very, very uh, key to me. Uh, that's why I spent six years in, this, uh, in ADI, which is uh, the leading macrofinance institution in Europe. Uh, doing it now through a fintech is also something that is making a lot of sense to me. So, so the the, the only I think um, thing that is making me uh, waking up every morning is do am I am I really useful to uh, let's say uh, try to compensate uh, unbalanced situation or try to bring solutions facing um, uh, today's I mean our society's main challenges challenges. Right. And I mean, you said about, you know, be, being useful, but I suppose also um, there's a bit of a difference, isn't there, in terms of perhaps the way you're perceived and bankers in general are perceived. You know, the bankers don't always get a good uh, reputation or a good rap, as we would say. Um, do, do other kind of, you know, banks, do they look they look down on um, on Nickel for kind of being a, a bank for perhaps uh, more financial inclusion and, and, and uh, 
uh, more marginalized uh, sectors of society? Or are they jealous of you because people actually like you because you're doing good rather than being perceived to just be making money? Well, I think it's a bit of everything. At the very be- at the very beginning, I even think that no one understood the project. No one believed it was possible or it would make sense or someone would feel comfortable going in a tobacco shop to open a bank account. Uh, now it has changed a lot because the figures have changed a lot, uh, of course. And, and also we've, we've broadened our clients, uh, let's say our clients' profiles. We're not only for the most vulnerable ones. It's something that is very key inside Nickel because our clients are very proud to be Nickel clients. They share. And the biggest, let's say, acquisition lever of Nikkel is, is the word of mouth effect. The client satisfaction is so high that people are sharing. And they say to their friends, okay, go and change your bank, which is something that is really uncommon because when you go back to what we do, we just provide a current account. So it's not the first thing you will share with your friends. But actually, your current account is so much linked to your, to the sense of um, autonomy, to the sense of freedom that that at the end of the day you share how much nickel is changing your life to your friends and family that's why the growth is is becoming bigger and bigger and now the i think everyone understands that we are building something unique that's why we are seeing some like traditional players trying to copy and paste what we're doing uh and uh and 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 the 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 way our competitors are looking at us has changed a lot over the, the past 10 years Right. I think I also read one of your founders once got a Christmas card from uh, from customers, which is perhaps not something um, bank uh, founders often get. But I understand outside of Nickel, I mean, what 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 would we find uh, Marie uh, doing on the weekend? I understand you're quite handy with a with a hammer and a and uh, <laughs> and doing things around the house. It's true that actually I'm I'm, I'm leading a, a definitely a fintech, one of the, the the most successful fintechs or very digital company. But but in reality, I'm I'm very much handy and I. Just love doing things with with my hands, which is uh, not at all uh, what I, I do at work. So I I don't know. I I love uh, repainting my 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 uh, home, or I even once uh, rebuilt one uh, the motor of one Solex. I don't know what it, what is the name. It's a very old, you know, small uh, um, kind of uh, mo- uh, motorbike, but a very small one. So uh, these are things I, I really enjoyed uh, doing at home. And of course, spending time with my family because uh, I have two little kids uh, and one a husband. And with such a, 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 an enthusiastic professional life, sometimes you need also to secure time with your own. Lovely. Okay. Well, I know where to uh, where to go if I need uh, a, a motorbike fixed as as well as a bank account. <laughs> exactly. All right. There can't be many people that can provide both of those. All right. So uh, look, a key part of this interview, Marie, is to get your take on the future of finance. But first. We're going to take a very quick break, after which we're going to continue our conversation with Nickel CEO Marie de Grand Guillot. Welcome back. Don't forget, if you're not already a full member of our community, everything you need to join can be found at www.parisfintechforum.com. And now, Marie, uh, let's talk about the future of finance. So, um, Marie, we, we mentioned earlier, of course, in 2017, you were bought by BNP Paribas. Other neo banks have also been bought, um, but Often they're bought and then they're kind of quietly closed down. Um, So yours is perhaps the most successful combination of a big bank with the neobank in the world. Why did it work and where others have failed? And what does this mean for future mergers of neobanks and uh, more traditional banks, do you think? 
Yes, we are definitely one of the very, very few examples of uh, fintech being acquired by such a large bank and accelerating its growth inside such a group. I mean, I think the first days were very key. So the acquisition, uh, let's say, process w- was something very key in this success. Uh, I think there was a very, very uh, strong uh, alignment between the founders selling their companies and the BNP Paribas top management, namely Thierry Laborde at, at this stage. They definitely understood uh, and they shared the common vision for the first day. Then this acquisition process was very fast. It was a one-week process because many banks were, I mean, on the on the on the line, let's say, and and. And I think the trust between Bepe Paribas and, and Nika Founders was one of the key things that made the deal uh, at the end of the day. Then, just after the acquisition, I think one key that was very, very important was the, the governance. And, and we were um, directly reporting to the top management of the bank, not the French retail bank or not any you know digital kind of uh, specialist inside the bank which enabled uh, BNP Paribas to kind of um, free nickel from many, many uh, aspects of or, or, or heavy aspects of such a big bank uh, that enabled nickel to really pick and choose uh, what would be the best thing to implement inside the fintech um, at which stage of the de- de- development of the company. And, uh, and that's why when you look at it now, five years after, uh, you can see that we really have one of the strongest uh, operating model because we have implemented everything that the group, uh, in terms of procedures, compliance, legal risk, or IT security, everything that Ben Paribas Group is implementing in any other business plans that they have. But we have done that uh, step by step we, with a really strong uh, alignment on strategy. And it's definitely explaining uh how come, I mean, uh, this success story, this, this marriage has, uh, has worked so well. And, you know, we, we talked already, Nikkel being a bit of a hybrid of a modern neobank and a, almost like a traditional physical bank. Uh, banks in general are obviously very excited about it in artificial intelligence and the benefits that it can bring. Um, how is Nikkel deploying artificial intelligence and what impact overall on the industry do you expect it to have? Yes, we are, of course, involving and investing a lot in this field. Um, I think it's, it's any, like, like any other, um, breakthrough or technological, uh, innovation that okay, we are at Nikkei are thinking, how can it be useful? So we try not to, you know, being the first one innovating in a technology and, and sometimes it can at the end, uh, be a bit superficial. We're really trying to, okay, where do we see the, the full efficiency and power of this tool? Today, I would say that there are two big fields where we believe that it's going to bring a lot. The first is the fighting against fraud and money laundering, uh, because with those tools, you can, of course, uh, gather and analyze a lot of data in a very innovative way. And in this field, I think it's going to be a tool for the fraudsters or as well as for us, which is, let's say, another tool to <laughs> find, uh, to fight against each other. Uh, but, uh, but uh, of course, so we have to take uh, the most uh, of what it can bring to us. And the second one, it could be in the client relationship management. I'm sure that with those, um, AI, with the AI and generative AI, I'm sure that we'll support and be even more uh, effective with our staff and we as our team to really have a strong, a trustful relationship to our clients. And, uh, and removing the administrative part or the, the, the routines or the, the heavy routines, not the good ones, but the, the, the heavy administrative routines that sometimes our staff have because we are in a regulated environment. This is bringing complexity to our teams. Of course, we're trying not to share this complexity with our clients. It's something that is very key to our success. But with those tools, I'm sure that we will, ch- it's going to change the way our our teams are working with the with our clients to to bring a lot more value to the clients at the end of the day uh, and given the amount of money it takes to make these investments in artificial intelligence i would imagine that this is also another advantage for you in that you are part of a much bigger um organization that can afford uh, to to spend the kind of money uh, that's needed um would you say that is it fair to say that bigger banks are going to be able to 
take advantage of the AI revolution more so than the smaller um, smaller banks? Or is it just the same question that the older ones aren't really as nimble and kind of don't really see what, what needs to be done or to, to make the decisions as quickly as the smaller, nimbler ones who, who may maybe, you know, uh, find it easier to catch up uh, with the more established banks? I mean, I think both visions are right. It's like, you know, when I, I joined Nickel or the financial industry five years ago, everyone was saying, oh, you know, the GAFA, they're, new, they, they're the new banks and the banks are dead. I mean, and actually at the end of the day, I mean, maybe, of course, there are new competitors that are bringing a lot of pressure on the, on the market. I'm not saying that nothing is, no, nothing has changed, but what you can see that banks are really able to, to invest quite a lot when they see a new challenge. And I'm quite impressed with for example, the digital experience, we're not at the end of the story, but banks are really able to react quite fast. And at least inside BNP Paribas, AI is already one of the main topics that everyone is discussing. So when I see everyone, when I say everyone is discussing, I'm not, sh- I'm not saying, oh, we're perfect with the best ones. We know all the, you know, the user, uh, we, we know, we know all the use cases and everything, but I'm sure. Uh, that that at the end of the day, this wave will be uh, also uh, a strong asset from for the banks. Uh, I'm not at all. Um, I mean, and env- um, foreseeing that the banks will miss this one. Then it's a matter of how how much it's going to cost. Where do we where the banks will choose to uh, to, to invest and how they will implement the the innovations. But uh, but I'm sure that it's going to change a lot. Uh, how banks will be working in the coming years. And finally, um, Marie, uh, you know, one of the trends we see in finance is the desire to make make it more sustainable in terms of whether it's the environment or the impact on society. Uh, Nikel clearly is on trend here. Uh, you seemingly found a sweet spot between making money and having an impact. Do you think the rest of the industry, you know, has noted this and and is going to try to emulate uh, and follow what uh, what you have done more so? Yes, I definitely think that we are much ahead of, of, if not everyone, the big majority of the players in that field, because we are by design impactful. We are by design inclusive. And when I say that, I'm not just saying that we provide the same product to everyone, no matter how much they earn, no matter what is their age, where they live, what is the potential business we can do with us. The, this universal approach that we have from the first day is, of course, very key, but we try to continue building this at each step of the company. So, for example, if you are, if you have trouble hearing, uh, you can contact us and you will be, we will be able to answer your questions by, by video instead of, you know, on, um, on, uh, or call centers. Uh, we, there are many ways where we try to be inclusive. It's something very strong in our, in our DNA. And even when we launch any new, new idea, at the end of the day, we have a Committees, of course, when we look at the budget, the investment, the complexity of everything, but we also look if it's totally in line or not with the DNA of the company, and if it's something that is making sense from a from a purpose point of view. So in that field, I'm sure we are ahead, but I'm definitely sure that it's going to change at a massive scale, and I'm very happy for that as a citizen or as a as a client of all the the services I I, uh, I subscribe to. Okay. Um, so look, it's time now for our round of rapid fire questions, Marie. Uh, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, great. So I'm just putting 90 seconds on my timer. Just require, uh, require one word answers. Um, and I will start in just a minute. When we run out of time, we will stop. Away we go. So what fintech segment has the biggest potential over the next five years, in your opinion? Payment. What is the biggest pain point in your everyday financial life that you'd like to see resolved? Questions I receive from, from, from my banks. Are bank bosses ready for the AI revolution? Getting ready. Are customers ready? In one word, it's tough. I'm not sure it's going to change much from the customers. <laughs> All right. All right. D- do you think regulators in the EU and the United States have kept pace with all the new possibilities and behaviors we're seeing in the financial industry? Well, regulators are innovative as well. 
Have you ever invested in crypto? Never. Are physical points of sales part of the future of finance? Yes, definitely. Are bank, are bank branches part of the future of finance? Less and less. Okay, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 is the most likely, 1 is the least likely. How likely is it that in the next 10 years, one of the neobanks will be as profitable as a top-tier legacy bank? Out of, out of 10, you can answer that. Um, eight. Eight out of 10. Okay, so I'm afraid we're out of time for our round of rapid fire questions and for our conversation. Sorry, I just want to thank you, Nicole, CEO, Marie de Grand Guillot, uh, for joining me today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And for everyone watching, we will be back again next time with another big name from the world of finance and technology. We do hope you'll be able to join us again then. Uh, in the meantime, don't forget to subscribe to the Paris Fintech Forum YouTube channel and to follow us on X at Paris Fin Forum. That's all for now. See you next time. Bye-bye.